Welcome to the Informed Pregnancy and Parenting Podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Elliot Berlin. Our guest today is a truly wonderful person, a rare gem of a human being, and I mean that from the bottom of my heart. Plus, she's a star on both the big screen and the small screen. She's an actress who has appeared in the Academy Award-winning film, The Artist, NBC's iconic daytime series, Duel, Days of Our Lives, (laughs) ABC's General Hospital, and is a regular leading lady on the Hallmark Channel. She doesn't let her successful career interfere with raising her family, her foster and adopted children together with her husband, and volunteering for several important charity organizations. And now she's expecting her first biological child any second, any minute, yeah, any, minute. any hour. <laughs> You're very close. Jen Lilly, welcome to the podcast. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. I'm super excited to be here. I've listened to probably every podcast that you've oh my gosh you've put out. I, I have know. to keep making more. Where do you, you hear have this to keep, one? I know. Okay, great. Yeah, yeah. Maybe <laughs> <laughs> this was my last one. <laughs> um, I really mean everything that I said about you. It's just Thanks. really uh, special to know you. You're a wonderful person thank and you so um, much. unique in many ways. Let's go to the beginning. Where are you from? How'd you get to be here? Gosh. Um, Okay, brevity is not my strength. So I'm from Roanoke, Virginia. Hurry up. Great. Uh, I'm from Roanoke, Virginia, which is not to be confused with the Lost Colony. Gosh, so many people would be like, oh, Roanoke. You know, like, you know, are you from Roanoke, like the Lost Colony? And I'm like, that's like asking someone if they're the last of the Mohicans. Oh, you know textbook. what I mean? Like, well, that's no. so. No, you can't be from the Lost Colony. You can't be. No. So anyway, so I'm from Roanoke, Virginia. And, you know, which so, but you're from New York. I always like to know where people are from, right? I'm and, a New Yorker. Yeah, you're a New Yorker. So I consider myself an East Coaster. So funny how you say it. What? New Yorker. New Yorker. New yeah. Yorker. New Yorker. <laughs> so, yeah, so I'm from Virginia. So you would consider me a Southerner, but any Southerner would consider me a damn Yankee. Right. You and, don't fit uh, in anywhere. I don't fit in anywhere. Dang it. And I didn't fit in in Virginia, I suppose. I, um, Gosh, I wanted to do a million things, which is probably why acting was a good choice for me. <laughs> I um, wanted to be a missionary at one point. I wanted to be oh, really? a Spanish court interpreter. I wanted to be a teacher or a geologist. I love science. And wow. then, yeah, I know. And so diverse. In your I know. I really love science. I ended up getting a degree in environmental science because I was just taking the classes as electives. And one of my professors finally <laughs> said to me, she was like, Are you, what are you, what is your goal? And I was like, Oh, I'm going to be an actress because I'd already auditioned for this film in Virginia. I went to University of Virginia, didn't use my degree. My parents were very nervous when I told them I wanted to be an actress. And uh, I auditioned on a whim for an open call audition for a movie called The Loss of Life, which has since been destroyed. And I, the posters were all over oh, the campus. Like, ironic that loss the of The loss life of life, I know. Has been lost. I know, right? Crazy. So there were these posters for open call auditions all over campus. And Wait, since they, you're in college. I'm in college, University of Virginia. And you have Virginia. not done acting? No, not really. I mean, I did church plays, but are we going to like <laughs> right, right, church right, skits, right. you know, like to scare people? <laughs> like, you're going to hell. No, I'm just kidding. Um, so, but you kind yeah. of must have inside your heart wanted to. I mean, I've always liked the art of storytelling, but I think I saw these auditions, this open call audition, and I think it more annoyed me, maybe as an environmental kiddo that was just like, gosh, what a waste of paper. You know, they were everywhere. So I started thinking about it and I had a a boyfriend who had given me, an (laughs) ex-boyfriend, who had given me a um, a video camera because he was like, oh, you're kind of into like creative stuff and documenting things. Like I love, I've always been really interested in comedy and things like that. And so I was like, oh, wait a second. I think I have a video camera at home. I'm going to go home to Roanoke, drive from Charlottesville to Roanoke. And I just would record myself practicing. I had decided to participate in the open audition, I think as like a dare to myself. So I went home to Roanoke and I recorded myself over and over and over again doing the the dialogue. And I would watch it back and ask myself, like, do I believe that? And then once I finally felt like I believed my audition, I went in because I want to do everything with excellence. And I booked it on the spot. And then I was like, oh, (laughs) crap. (laughs) <laughs> but I got on set and I was like, oh, wow, I feel like film crews, particularly and people who work in film and television are just so fascinating and grounded. So that's how I got into acting. And, and then I, I told my parents that was something I thought I wanted to pursue. And they were like, OK, cool. We're from Virginia. And um, what about law school? And um, <laughs> why don't you get straight A's and get a degree from University of Virginia. And then if you still want to do it, well, we won't be helping you, but at least you'll have a degree so that when you come home destitute, you can... I'm going to talk to my kids. I'm like, look, (laughs) 
have some salad and some chicken. And if you're still hungry for that giant cupcake after the meal. Yeah. So I got a degree and I ended up graduating early from UVA because I was taking night classes at night with a local director who had moved from L.A. because he had gone through a divorce. But it was an amical divorce and he had two kids. And so he was like, I guess I'm moving to Virginia now. So I started taking acting classes from him at night. Oh, wow. How fortuitous. And paying for that because my parents were like, we are not helping you pay for that. So I worked in an ice cream shop. I paid for my acting classes with this director from L.A., graduated early, and then I uh, moved to L.A., much to my parents' horror. But yeah. When was that? 2007, right during the writer's strike, which was a really bad oh, time to timing. move here. Yeah. But I made an eight-year plan because I am pretty maniacal. I'm pretty scientific in my approach. Like, I have a science degree. And I researched what's called IMDb, which is Internet Movie Database. And I realized that any kind of overnight sensation or up-and-coming actress or actor, they've really been working for about a decade before they, you know. Then they get a break. Yeah, then, then they get a break. Like, and so I was they like. They start counting from there. Yeah. So I was like, I'm going to give myself eight years, try really hard. And if after eight years, like, I'm still going nowhere, then I go be a teacher or I go to law school or I do something, you know, normal for a Virginian. <laughs> That's how I ended up here. Wow. And yeah. how was your eight-year plan? How did it go? It went really years? well, other than the writer's strike. Could not have... Um, Picked the worst time to come. <laughs> it was the worst time to come to L.A. And and even though I was non-union, which meant I could have worked on things, SAG, which is the Screen Actors Guild, it's the union the actors you know comply with, they made it pretty clear that if you, as a non-union actor, went behind their backs and worked, you would never be in the union. Right. Yeah. So I did background work for a little while. Got What's my. So it's like the performers that are blurry and they're oh, in the background, okay. you know? And I was doing that as a survival job because there were no there was no money and it was like if I wanted to audition I couldn't get a job with my degree because then I'd have a nine to five. You know, you're, and so you're due just before the big surge of babies. Like I see a giant yeah. surge every year in September. There's oh really? A, Huge surge of babies, which, you know, it's like nine months after the holidays. So they're Christmas and New Year's babies. And nice. We call them champagne babies. But that year of the strike, like, oh. I don't remember if it was November ish, whatever yeah, yeah, yeah. it was, like nine months after that, there was a huge surge of babies, too. There's I bet because nobody like had anything to do. Strike babies. Yeah, yeah, people were just home and <laughs> just bored. Bored. Yeah. That's so funny. Yeah, we had strike babies. Yeah. So I got my SAG card. Um, Clint Eastwood actually picked me out of a crowd of about 3,000 girls. And said, you have a 1920s face, and I need you. And so he he taft heart laid me in the changeling. He thought your face was 100 years old? He did. He thought my face was 100 years old. How rude, right? He's super <laughs> cool. Oh, my gosh. he was He's really down to earth. He would have, like, lunch with the, the background, which is crazy, because they train you not to kind of speak to the background. I always do. Hmm. But anyway, that's how I got into the union. And then I, once the strike was over, I started booking. Do you have a preference for, like, film or television or a specific genre? No, I don't. I, I love comedy so much. I didn't know I was funny until I moved to L.A. <laughs> uh, because my family is so witty. And, and they're all in Mensa. I mean, legitimately in Mensa. Oh, they're smart witty. They're very smart. And so I was always at the dinner table, you know, and it'd be like, I was like five jokes behind. And then I'd come <laughs> up with like a comeback. And they were like, what? What? You, you saw know? that? Yeah. So... <laughs> I love comedy, but then I find if I do too much comedy, I crave drama. Yeah. And then when I did the soaps, all I wanted to do was comedy. Balance. Yeah, so I need balance. Hmm. Uh, and luckily you get it. You're all over the map. <laughs> all over the map, yeah. You are. And you sing? I do. Did you study singing? No. It's just natural for you. Um, yeah, I mean, I grew up singing in church, like most <laughs> singers, like the, always the background. Gosh, it was 2014, I believe. But in L.A., you know, we don't have seasons, so you never really know what year it was because you can't mark it's, it. There's no and backdrop. I think, yeah, yeah. I think it was 2000. So it was just a blue sky. Yeah, blue sky. Sometime in 2014, I did um, Baby It's Cold Outside, the Christmas song, with my co-star Eric Martzoff on Days of Our Lives because he's a Broadway. Duel. Yeah, on Duel because he's, he's a Broadway singer. And I thought, the fans will love that. Let's do that for fun. And that song did really well. And so the next year, I was like, I'm going to do a Christmas album because you can't mess up a Christmas album. I recorded it. I got a great team together. I had Frank Sinatra's Musicians on it, which was amazing to me. Frank Sinatra is my absolute favorite. Aww. And I recorded it with Rob Christie, who was he's an amazing producer. But it was just like we did it in his like living room. It wasn't a big thing. It was like, Everything was kind of my scratch take. 
And so I just did it as a bucket list item. Like, how hard could it be to do a Christmas album? That's what I always say. Yeah, you know. <laughs> <laughs> or a Hanukkah album. Yeah. And, uh, Hanukkah seems even yeah. harder. Yeah, that would be, it would be much harder. You know, there's only dreidel, dreidel. I don't know how many. We have yeah, terrible many, yeah, songs. Yeah. I mean, if you yeah. think about how many Jews created great Christmas albums, <laughs> they do nothing for Hanukkah. But it went Adam to number Sandler one. Is all we got. Yeah, your, Adam's, your album? It, yeah, it went to oh, number wow. one on Amazon, and it ended up outselling Frank Sinatra and Dean Martin and Ella Fitzgerald and, no and Harry Connick Jr. It's that 100-year-old face you have. Yeah, it's my 100-year-old face. Yeah, it's really, <laughs> it's really working for me. Uh, and uh, and so then soul. I then I long story short, I ended up after my fans badgered me. I thought maybe I'll do an album. Then I thought no, I won't do an album. And then I met my producer Adrian Gerbitz, and he was nominated that year for Andrew Day's Cheers to the Fall, Best Album and Best New Artist. I mean, his accolades are ridiculous. Um, the Bodyguard soundtrack, that's him. And so he's like, let's do an album. And so how do you say no to that? So I recorded it, but I haven't fully released it yet. I've just released. Oh really. Yeah. You have a lot of things to release at the moment. I do, you know. I, I got pregnant and I was like, let me just put this on hold because I'm right. not going to want to tour, you know. Until you release that. Yeah, until I release this. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Uh, all right. So we're going to take a little break and come back because <laughs> this, although it's going to be your first biological child, is not in any way your first child. Yeah. And uh, I'd love to learn more about that. Don't go anywhere. We'll be right back with Jen Lilly. <laughs> Welcome back to the Informed Pregnancy Podcast. We're talking to Jen Lilly. So even though you're about to pop any second, <laughs> and I, sometimes I say that and my guest is 36 weeks pregnant, you know, but yeah. you're like 39. Nine. Yeah. <laughs> it's coming. Yeah. Uh, and we're going to talk about your pregnancy and your plans for birth in our third segment. But today cool. let's talk about the kids you already have. When did you start fostering children? I started fostering my son, Caden, who I've now adopted, which is so fun to be able to say his name and everything, because um, you can't in foster care. They're, they're protected. They're under witness protection. Really? Um, you can't say their name. Mm-mm. Can't show their photos. Can't say their names. Can't say really anything about them. And he was also, our... just, I hate to cut you off, but we talked about this. We're going to come back and do a whole episode. Yeah, we're going to do a whole episode. Once you release that baby, all about foster care yeah. and adoption, because it's a passion for you, and it's something that I don't know nearly enough about. It's such a fascinating topic. I, I mean, acting is like a hobby compared to foster care for me. I'm just so passionate about it. But he was our first placement back in October 1st, 2016. And, you know, my husband and I, we really didn't think we were going to maybe have a family. We thought, let's just foster Essentially, you know, like let's. Oh, just for a little yeah. while at a time. Right. Let's Until just um, help these kids, hopefully rehabilitate them a bit, give them some TLC that they desperately deserve and do some good. And then, you know, be a couple and be able to eat cake for dinner if we want, you know, or <laughs> watch a marathon of Frasier because uh, we love Frasier um, mm. and all these things. But so we got Caden and it was supposed to be, gosh, I think we were told three months and now it's permanent. And then, which is awesome. We really are really happy about that. He's, How old was he when incredible. you got him? He was four months. Oh, wow. He sounded like Darth Vader. He had a breathing disorder called laryngomalacia. Oh, yeah. Um, and which is just when their esophagus, uh, the palate that shuts off your esophagus from your lungs and your, your stomach um, – it's too big so he sounded like darth vader so i got the like newborn experience of like every 15 minutes i was awake because i wasn't sure if he was just gasping for air and he had the chubbiest feet so i bought the outlet which is a great monitor outlet yeah and i it's like a little sock yeah it's a little sock they're like three hundred dollars but i was like three hundred dollars for my sleep and this kid's health is fine but he was so chubby that you couldn't even get the toddler sock around his foot. So we never used it. So I was awake every 15 minutes. <laughs> and then, um, yeah, and then we, you know, we got to keep him, which was amazing. And now we are fostering his little brother. And you, you thought you would have him for three months. Yeah. First of all, is it never having had kids? Is it all, all those issues you just mentioned aside? <laughs> is it weird to just start taking care of a bit? Like, how do your instincts even kick in? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, well, what was funny is we were prepping for an eight-year-old girl that I had mentored for years in a program through an organization called Child Help, and it's called uh, Special Friends, and it's kind of like Big Brothers, Big Sisters. And so I had mentored her, thought we would <laughs> have her, and then we got the call about Caden, and I had actually said no 
to his case at mm. first because they told us in training, look, there's like 40,000 children in L.A. that need a foster home. What? In L.A.? Okay. Listen to this. This is crazy. And we'll get into this more on like the foster care podcast. Los Angeles alone, this is so embarrassing, makes up 10% of the kids in foster care in the United States, our city alone. So they had always told us in training, look, if you can't do something, don't say yes, because there are 39,999 other kids waiting placement, and oh, yeah. we need you for them. I can't even close my job. That's I, a, a it was staggering, staggering number. Staggering number. So we took in Caden. I had, I'm an older sibling. I'm one of four. I'm the second oldest, but everybody thinks I'm the oldest. <laughs> they all call me mom. It's so embarrassing. Aww. So I'm like very maternal. Even your older sibling? <laughs> yeah. Like they're just like, you know, I've, I got married young. I've been married 12 years and like I'm just in my early 30s. You know, it's just like I just was always kind of very maternal. So I wasn't worried about Caden. We threw together Amazon Prime registry and we because our, our whole house was set up for an eight-year-old girl. And so we got this four-month-old boy, and all these people are just—we just had a village, like our church and different people that came through. My husband was a nervous wreck, and he's a drummer, so this is the best thing. <laughs> he goes to church the next day, and he says to our bass player, and thank God I overheard it. He goes, yeah, man, I was nervous about dropping the baby, <laughs> but um, it's like— I don't know that he said like because it's not like Jason to say like, but he was so astounded by the change, right, that happens in the first 24 hours of parenting. He goes, it's like you wouldn't drop your base. You wouldn't drop a baby. <laughs> 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 so we just kind of rolled with it. You know, you just you just roll with it. And now we're, we started fostering his little brother also at four months, and he's – now I'm pregnant. I can't do math at all anymore. I mean, basically, with the dick, my UVA degree went really far. <laughs> Once I'm pregnant, I can't do anything. Um, let's see. He is six to, uh, 16 months old, his little brother now. So we've had him a year. Oh, wow. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Also since four months. Yeah. Also since it's the magic number for that family. For you. I told his mom they're not, she's not allowed to get pregnant again until baby Julie's here. And so you need a little break? Yeah. And yeah, <laughs> other I'd have to phone a friend because I, you know, like, I don't know. <laughs> yeah. Um. How different will it be, do you think, to have a biological child? You know, it's so funny because I almost doubt my love for her. It's like, to me, I think a lot of parents I've talked to, you know, when they're anticipating the next child, you think, how could I love a child? I could I like, how could my heart make any more room for another child? I already love these children so much and it just expands, right? And then you have this whole new capacity for love for the next child. But sometimes I'm like, will I love you as much as your brothers? I just love them so much. But of course I will. But I don't know. I don't see a difference. I really don't, like in my head. Yeah, your your kids are your kids. Yeah, my kids are my kids. W- was this a planned pregnancy? It was a planned pregnancy. So, But that was before you knew there was going to be a little brother. No. No. Yes and no. That's interesting. So we <laughs> – I knew with their mom. So when you're a foster parent, you – monitor visits with the birth parents because that's court mandated, which is a very tricky, tricky position to be in, middle mom, where you can't judge them, but you're totally judging them, but you're trying to love them at the same time. And I knew she was pregnant. She never told me she was pregnant, so it was super awkward the whole, oh, like, wow. eight months. Yeah. And I'd be in her visits with Caden, knew she was pregnant, and I had also gotten pregnant in January. No. Yeah, January of 2018. And, you know, little brother was born in March of 2018. And I remember with that pregnancy, I woke up Jason in the middle of the night. And I was like, oh, my gosh, we're pregnant because we weren't trying. It was the first, we weren't trying. We just weren't not trying for the first time in our marriage. You know, we weren't trying to prevent a pregnancy, I guess is what I'm saying. Right. So I was like, oh, my gosh, I'm pregnant. And the second thing out of my mouth is what are we going to do when baby, you know, X arrives? And we just sat there kind of somberly excited but also very somber in the bed thinking – Unfortunately, the cycle of foster care is that this next baby is probably also going to be placed in foster care. And my sweet husband was like, I guess we're just going to have like twins. I don't know. Oh, wow. We'll just figure it out. And I was like, okay. So then I miscarried in um, March of 2018. Uh, Anywhere from 10 to 12 weeks. It was kind of blurry on that. I'm sorry. And it's okay. You know, miscarriage happens. And it was interesting because my first thoughts when I miscarried were of his little brother. And I thought, okay, this will make that easier because I know we're going to cut a call about that little boy. So I knew he was born. I had looked up, you know, all these posts about him. Like I knew he was born. I was kind of keeping tabs on social media of this kid. And then we got the call. I don't know. Like for me, he was kind of what people call your rainbow baby. It was like I knew I was going to get this kid. Oh, right. 
But when we got the call about the little brother, Jason was freaking out. Um, I was in between a bunch of movies, and he basically had a single dad it for two months oh, because wow. I was out of town. And that With was two the, kids. Yeah. Well, he had we had Caden, and then we got the call. Yeah. About the baby, and, and he, he only said, has one base to not drop. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> and so he was like, "I can, we can't do it. We cannot. We cannot take another kid." And I said, "You need to go pray about that." I said, because you're you're being fearful right now. And, um, you know, call me back in five minutes when you've, like, taken a breath. And he was like, yeah, we have to take this kid. But then the next conversation we had was, well, are we going to still try to get pregnant? Because three under three is insane. <laughs> and I work all the time and he works all the time. So it was just nuts. Um, but we decided foster care is really unpredictable. It took us three years to adopt Caden. And, you know, I'm 34 years old. Like, you can't wait forever. So... We were like, I guess we're doing this. And we were lucky we got pregnant on our first try. And that's a funny story because we – I'm a big planner, you know, with my eight-year plans. And I make <laughs> new eight-year plans, by the way. Like, I renew them. Oh, like, really? okay, now what are my goals for the next eight years? <laughs> so I was in bed one day looking at my, like, ovulation app. I use Ovia for anyone who's listening. <laughs> it's very accurate. And I'm looking at my filming schedule for the next couple months with Hallmark. And I was like, Crap. Every time I'm going to be back, I would be ovulating, but there's a thing called the shuttles method, right? Shuttles or shuttles. Oh, to try to have a boy yeah. or girl? Yeah, so it's boy or girl. And so the, the theory is if you have sex early, the, so this is a metaphor for life, girl sperm, can they swim slower than the boys, but they live up to five days. Boys swim and then die. Like they swim Very fast quickly. and die. Yeah. Like what a metaphor, an accurate metaphor for men and women in yes, life. Absolutely. You know, like women are so <laughs> agile and just like amazing at staying, surviving. So I'm looking at the calendar and I'm like, oh my gosh, every time I'm back over the next six months, it's a boy window. And so I looked at him and I said, well, um, if we have sex right now, <laughs> We might well, you're in the girl have a window? girl. Oh. Yeah, I'm like literally sitting there in bed looking at the app. And I was like, would we be upset if we got pregnant this early? Because we were planning on getting pregnant in November. And it was, I don't know, whatever month it was, October. We were going to, no, we were going to get pregnant January, February. This is October. And I said, oh, and she'd be born right around my birthday. And so he was like, that's fine. You know, it's like if you ask a guy, like, hey, do you want to have sex right now? They're like, that's fine. Sure. So all he that... was like, sure. And we, so then. It also means yeah. we have to give away the house. Okay. Whatever. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So we got pregnant. And, um, but I knew, like, honestly, I honestly knew, like, three days after conception. I that could you were feel pregnant? it. Oh, really? Because I'd been pregnant before. And I was like, oh my gosh, I'm so tired. My boobs are so heavy. And so I told him, I said, I think. It's like my I life. think we had success. Yeah, <laughs> I honestly, love you so yeah. much. <laughs> I said, I think we were successful, dude. And, uh, so then I packed up for the next movie, and I, I said, I'm ordering a couple of things on Amazon. Don't open them. And it was a shirt that said Preggers. Oh. And so on Thanksgiving, I FaceTimed him from Canada wearing the Preggers shirt. Oh, my goodness. That's how I told him. But, yeah, so she was kind of planned, how but it was also kind of, of not yeah. planned. But we really wanted a girl. What about um, right now? Because yeah. we have a girl window. I like yeah. it. <laughs> <laughs> so, and, and she's due, you know, July 31st, which is when my mom was due with me. Really? My mom was due with me on July 31st. I was born August 4th. So you think August 4th? I'm hoping she doesn't last that long because my parents (laughs) just flew in and I really want their help. They Uh, leave on the 15th. But I'll um, I'll help you with whatever you need. Oh, thanks, man. You're a great person. Great. (laughs) Um, We're going to take another break, but then I want to. We come back. I want to find out about this pregnancy and how it's been and what you're planning for the old uh, birthday. So excited! Don't go anywhere. We'll be right back. Welcome back to the Informed Pregnancy Podcast. We're talking to Jen Lilly. So, you got the kid in there. You got the girl window, just, <laughs> just by a hair. Yeah. <laughs> um, how's pregnancy been? You know, I was thinking the other day, I've, I've been admittedly and ashamedly admittedly a little sour about pregnancy. You know, I, I'm such an A-type doer. And I said to my husband the other day, I was like, you know what? This actually hasn't been a bad pregnancy. It's just that I get frustrated when I can't do the things that I know I'm capable of doing. Well, because you're such a doer. Because there's just like a pole in my body. It's like, you know, I want to go out and paint or do the yard or whatever. And I can't do anything because there's this like person in my way. (laughs) But she's awesome and it's been okay. I didn't really have morning sickness. I had nausea. You're always so positive though. I know. It was not like me. It was really like, why am I being... But even... I've only known you in pregnancy, and you're super positive. Oh, that's nice. Thanks. I can't wait to see what you're like not, Prego. 
<laughs> so it's been a good pregnancy, I would say, but I really only want to do it once. Oh, really? I just wanted to experience it because I think it's so cool what a woman's body can do. Does but I want to adopt all my other children. Does it feel as cool as you thought it would be? Um, Aside from the annoyances, which... I know. mean, the kicking and stuff is kind of cool, you know? Um, the heartburn's been unbearable. Mm. I, I'm hoping, I know it's a wives' tale, but I'm hoping she has like... Rapunzel link hair <laughs> just so I can justify, you know, oh, the hard yeah. That was worth it. Um, and, uh, what about your body changing, like how your body looks and feels? I've been so appreciative. I feel very beautiful, which I did not expect. I had eating disorders for so long, which is a common thing actresses struggle with, or it's a common thing girls struggle with. And so it was such a gift to me. I finally stopped having eating disorders like three years ago. But it was such an interesting thing being pregnant because my first trimester – I gained, for no reason other than I guess my body needed to, I gained 12 pounds. Who in the first? That's and my do- and I was, it was crazy. I was hungry every two hours as if I had never eaten in my life. You know, mm. like the hunger where you wake up in the morning and you're mm. nauseated? I know it. That every two hours. <laughs> and so I was like, this is horrible. And I was eating all the healthy things like quinoa and celery. I mean, my weight in celery. And I'm, ga- I'm looking at the calories and it's like doesn't even make mathematical sense. I gained 12 pounds. My doctor at the time was like, well, just don't eat fruit. And I laughed in his face because I thought that's a ridiculous thing to tell a pregnant woman. I kept eating fruit, but it wasn't like it wasn't like I was having like berries with sugar and bananas all day, you know. And so I was really kind of worried and then just decided to surrender to the weight gain. And just I just was praying for like a healthy baby. And I'm 39 weeks pregnant and I've gained exactly 25 pounds now. Oh, wow. So, you, so it uh, really evened out for me. Yeah. And, and because everything you're talking about, though, you were eating healthy food. It's not I like was eating incredibly healthy. Milkshaking it. Yeah. And then in my second trimester, I, after I was done filming, I got as many movies in, under the belt as I could. I did three or pun? four movies before I popped. Mm-hmm. Under the belt. Yeah. Under the belt. And then I didn't have any cravings this pregnancy. Really, I haven't. But I've had, like, cake, and I've had some mac and cheese and some things that maybe, mm. whatever. You know, they're delicious. But it's not like I've been You're so from maniacal. from Virginia, which is almost southern. I know. And so I've just been really— That's what, how you're supposed to eat. You're totally supposed to eat that way. But I felt really fortunate because I just, I just felt like, for me, it was like God being like, don't worry. Just take care of your baby, and I'll take care of you. I'm not going to wreck your body. You don't really have and a I southern wasn't... accent. Thank you. But, uh, you're welcome. <laughs> but when I'm around people from the South, I usually go get banana pudding. I don't know why. Banana pudding is delicious. Right afterwards. Okay. Well, yeah, we're going to go get banana yeah, pudding tonight. Let's okay. Do it. <laughs> On me. Uh, um, what are you planning for the birth? Gosh. Okay. Is so there a plan? I'm planning on it being an all natural, awesome experience. That's what I'm hoping for. That's what I've always hoped for. But as you know, I. It's been such a cool pregnancy because my daughter was breech, and I was told by my former obstetrician, I had always planned to do a birthing center. In Los Angeles, there's a couple birthing centers. They're pretty awesome. And then I found out my baby was breech, and I was like, oh. And I was told by my obstetrician at the time, who's awesome, but I will not mention his name. <laughs> he he be said- uh, protection as yeah, well. It's, he, yeah, he's because he's a great doctor. But he hadn't told me I had any options. He just said, okay, well, you're going to have a cesarean unless she turns, Mm -hmm. you know. And so then I started looking into all the alternatives, like how on earth do you turn a baby? I did all the spinning babies. I did the inversions. I did did type A. You did it all. Yeah, I did did it all. And and then I I realized I couldn't do a birthing center. So that was really disheartening. With a breech baby. Yeah, with a breech baby because of liability reasons and all the things, complications. And then I was just terrified. I'm terrified of a C-section. I find it to be the scariest, craziest, most Frankenstein operation. They take your organs out, man. They put them in a bowl and you're conscious for it. Yes. Nowadays, you can look through a plastic screen if you want to. No, thank you. Yeah, I, I mean, that think is you would. nuts. And so I thought that was my future unless I turned this baby. And then I uh, was talking to my best friend, Sayla, and she, she was like, well, she said, you know, there's a Dr. Fishburn. He'll do um, home birth breach. And I thought, no. My first thoughts of breach were <laughs> what probably most women think, which is that baby's folded in half, like double the width. You know, mm-hmm. tearing is inevitable. There's no way I'm doing vaginal breach. That sounds like the craziest thing. And then to do a home birth vaginal breach at the time, I thought, that's nuts. Like, that's not even an option. I met with her doctor, who's Dr. Valentin, and she's amazing. And I went into Dr. Valentin, and she decided to take me as a patient. You know, I was 36 weeks pregnant. 
35 maybe. And this is so recent. And, and she was so amazing. And for the first time in my life, which is sad, she gave me informed consent, which for anyone listening just means that she laid out all my options for me as a medical doctor who just wanted to help her patient, saying, okay, you can do vaginal breach. If you do vaginal breach, I don't do vaginal breach. But Dr. Brock in my office does vaginal breach. You could meet with him. We could try this. We could try this. You could go to Dr. Berlin, you know. <laughs> and you would, your name had come up three times at that point when she said, and I was like, I'm already going to go to Dr. Berlin. I've already oh, decided. For the and, banana but, pudding. For the banana pudding in the yeah. podcast. And, and so she just gave me all of my options, and I thought, I'm not going to do breach birth. That's nuts. But I had it in the back of my head. I met with you. We did all the adjustments. I did the moxibustion with Jason Starr in your office. He's great. I did the acupuncture. I did everything short of voodoo to turn my daughter. And <laughs> and while I was meeting with you, I started listening to the Informed Pregnancy podcast. Like I said, I've listened to all of them. And so in my last kind of month of pregnancy, it was the first time during the whole nine months where I've just been able to just be pregnant. Because I had my son's adoption, his brother's case had hit the fan during the pregnancy, so I was really focused on my other two children that were outside my body. And this last pregnancy, I've just been, uh, last month of pregnancy, I've been so focused on just voraciously getting as much information as I can. And my mind was opened to vaginal breach. I watched Heads Up, your documentary. I watched everything I could about breach. I watched YouTube breach births. And I read these. Like this is like the scientist nerd in me. I read like 80 page medical dissertations that I didn't even <laughs> understand, you know, like on why term breach study was a horrible, faulty study with no protocol and all the studies that have come out before it. And then listening to more podcasts and just like just getting all the info. And then I decided and Jason said to me, too, he's like, I think you should do vaginal breach. And so for my husband to say that because he's, you know, he's my husband, he's my protector. Yeah. It was such good confirmation. And he's not an opinionated guy, which is great because I'm such an A-type. But he was like, I think you can do this. Like, your body's made for this. And, you know, breach really isn't a problem. It's just not the norm. It's just a variation of normal. One in 25 babies are breach. You're strong. Why don't I meet with Dr. Brock? And so I met with Dr. Brock. I wrote Dr. Valentin the most lovely thank you note that I could, just thanking her for just giving me such informed consent. And I thought... All right, I'm going to have a breech baby, and we're going to do this. And I went into him after speaking with you at one of our sessions. I said, you know, I, I don't want to do an epidural unless I have to because I'm the person that gets, like, the one out of 1,000 side effects. Oh, complications. Always. Yeah. I wanted to deliver in a gravitational position. Not on your back. Not on my back. And I did not want an episiotomy. And those were my three, like, we're not doing these three things. And I wasn't sure if he would let me deliver without an epidural. And you in your office said, you know, he's really cool. I had heard him on your podcast. I think he'd probably be open to just hooking you up and getting you ready for an epidural for a crash cesarean if you needed to, and then not giving you medicine. So I was like, okay, I'll meet with him. Met with him. He's like, let's try ECV. I did not want to do ECV, which is external cephalic version. There's a whole podcast on it. I listened to it. And Dr. Brock, because of your podcast, is probably the only doctor I would have considered an ECV with. Mm. Because he doesn't medicate the mom. And he has such a good barometer for if the mom's in distress, baby might be in distress. He doesn't repeatedly try to turn the baby. He's very – Dr. Brock kind of has like a midwife spirit about him, but in a male obstetrician body. Yeah, weird, funky midwife. It's – yeah, he's he's so so good with the ECV. Yeah. I mean, he has such a great success rate with it and and I think no complication rate with it. No complication rate. um, You know. And I was scared to death. And I, he said, I said, I really don't want to do an ECV. And he said, well, you haven't done one with me. And I laughed. I said, I know. Like, you're <laughs> the only doctor I think I would try it with. He's like, let's schedule tomorrow. Wow. So that's, and then you recorded your ECV, right? I did record the video. Yeah. And I recorded some audio of how I was feeling before. So I'm at Cedar sinai about to do the external sphalic version Pretty scared, but feeling a little better than I was this morning. Um, I feel like Dr. Brock is very capable. I like that he's not going to give me a, an epidural. Epidurals also scare the bejesus out of me. 
Um, lots of medical things scare the bejesus out of me. The nurses are super nice, and I have confirmed that I definitely want to bring my own socks and my own robe. So, here we go. So I went in and we did the ECV and he did it in one attempt and she stayed. So now my plan is I'm going to deliver at Cedars, hopefully all natural. My mom had, my mom and both my grandmothers had precipitous labor. Meaning very fast. Meaning very, very fast, which is both a blessing and a curse. It could be a little bit of a train moving through your body. Yeah. When it's you like Because she could be born on the 405. I hope not. <laughs> well, you <know>? that, well <laughs> that too. But you also yeah. get sometimes like 20 hours of labor in two hours. Yeah. Exactly. So that's what happened with It's a lot my, of intensity. Yeah. And if you don't realize that it's going that fast, you're like, I can't do this for 20 hours. But then it, the baby's here. Yeah. And then so who's coming to your birth? I'm not 100% sure. I know my husband. Okay. <laughs> that's, Jason, gonna, yeah. that's a good one. He's kind of going to act as my doula. We've been working together. And I've just kept telling him, this is your birth as much as mine. And, you know, he's like, well, you're the one having the baby. And I'm like, yeah, that's our baby. This is our experience. You know, and you get to be part of it. And I'm hoping that I'll stay really calm. I've hired a videographer, which is exciting. Oh, wow. Um, my best friend, Sayla, may act as my doula. And then my mom and dad want to be at the hospital. But I told them, you know, I kind of need you with the kids. And I might want you in the waiting room. I don't know. Okay. Because my mom will either be really great or she'll make me really nervous. You know? That's so how I'm, moms are. Yeah. And so I don't know. I just told her, I was like, just give me some grace to... Not know, but I feel confident. I feel excited about the birth. I don't have any fear attached to it at all. I'm just super excited. Um, are there things that when when things become intense, are there things that you coping? think yeah, that will cope or comfort you or calm you? Um, I have a worship playlist, which is for me very calming. I have a lot of breathing techniques I've worked on. And then I know it's not at all the same as childbirth because I've never, you know, I've never delivered a baby. But I do have a really intense background of cystic cysts on my ovaries, and I've been hospitalized for it a bunch. And the first time I was 19, and I was going to my doctor for a checkup, had crazy cramps. I was the dead of heat in the summer. I went out to my dad's car, and I started whiting out, like blacking out. I realized I was going to faint and thought, I'm going to die of heat exhaustion in this car. So I got myself inside and went in and um, long story short, I was in so much pain. My body went into shock. And then because I didn't know why I was in pain, I didn't know what was going on and I was alone, I hyperventilated, which locked up my whole body. Um, it's like almost like a rigor mortis. And so my mom at that time, she was dropping my older brother and his friends off in Europe at the airport in, in D.C., five hours from Roanoke. And I realized like I thought I was dying. And so I called my mom because my body was seizing up and it was just horrible. And I <laughs> speed dialed my mom, pressed the six. She was a six on my speed dial. And I realized when she called me that she couldn't, I couldn't talk. And she was like, Jenny, Jenny, that's what I used to go by. 
And I said, nine, I don't want, I don't want. And she realized I was saying nine, one, one. She's <sighs> like, are you saying nine, one, one? And I was like, yeah, nine, one, one. Oh, boy. And so, of course, all the paramedics came. I was like fully naked at this point, you know. But it's like when your life isn't, you think at your 19. life, you don't care. At 19. And I was alone. And so they took me to the hospital and they were like, okay, you had a cyst that ruptured. It was so big. But because you weren't breathing, you seized up and you hyperventilated all the calcium or something out of your body. Magnesium is something in your bud, one of the um, oh, electrolytes. Calcium. Yeah, and then yeah. your muscles went to spasm. And so my muscles contracted and just, I freaked out. The second time it happened to me, my left ovary atrophied, almost lost it. Oh, wow. But I had told them I was at EVA and I had, was passing out. And I was like, they're like, are you pregnant? And I was like, no, I'm a virgin. Like, <laughs> just call 911. Here's my insurance cards. Don't talk to me. Like, I just need to breathe. Like, I just need to breathe as slow as I can. And they gave me a morphine drip for five hours. They kept coming in and saying, you know, how's your pain level? And I said, it's a 10. It's a 10. And they said, 10 is the highest. And I was like, it hasn't gone down. And um, they had to give me Pitocin and manually dilate my cervix. And a doctor had to stick his fist up me and rotate manually my left ovary. Oh, my God. And so I haven't experienced childbirth, but I have had, like, five to eight-hour contractions that, like, did not wane. Like, there was – it would be, like – I think it would be like being in transition for five to eight hours. Yeah, like this will be a lot more natural. And I'll be like, (laughs) oh, it's because my daughter's coming. I'm not dying. Right. My heart – There's a big prize at the end. Yeah, there's a big prize. And so – I just feel excited about it. Oh, yeah. I'm excited for you. Thanks. Hopefully it goes well. It's been cool to uh, be on a little part of the journey with you. Um, well, yeah. will you come back afterwards and totally share it Tell all? Tell you how wrong or right I was. <laughs> yeah, who knows? <laughs> yeah. I mean, that's the whole thing. You never really know. You don't know. And I know that you have this plan and that it's a loose plan. Like, you'll go with whatever happens. But, right? Am I yeah, just I mean, that? whatever is medically necessary to keep me and my daughter safe. Yeah. But Dr. Brock's so great because he's so pro mama. You yeah. know, he's so pro, like, let's do this the way you want to do natural. Yeah, he's pro your agenda. He doesn't care. If you yeah. want a C section, he'll be happy to do that too. It's and he just... doesn't rush. I've heard from the, my videographer is also a doula, and she's like, dude, I've done so many births with him. He never rushes the mom. Yeah, I've done breach births like, with cool. him as a doula. Oh, it's so cool. I kind of wanted her to stay breech, you know? <laughs> You're so funny. Yeah, uh, I thought maybe right. that's what the story. You mentioned a few things. First of all, the C-section, how you were terrified of it. I don't know if you ever got to listen to it, but we do have an episode called The Gentle Cesarean. I know. It still scared me. And, it is uh, informative, though. Yeah, it's informative. <laughs> like, if you're looking at having a cesarean, especially if you didn't want one or you're terrified of one, then uh, it's just talking through all the different things that happen. Yeah. Some of the choices you'll be able to make and what to expect and how to make it a beautiful, empowered, sacred birth, even though it wasn't your plan A. Mm-hmm. Um, and then Dr. Brock appears on many episodes, including the three-part series called Breach 101, Part 1, 2, and 3, and the vaginal breach after cesarean, mm-hmm. together with one of his clients, uh, our mutual client, who was breached with both her first baby and second baby. The first one was a cesarean birth, and with the second one, which nobody can get to turn, you know, Dr. Brock kind of laid out the pros and cons of both choices. And like you said, he's really mother-led. She yeah. chose to want to do the vaginal birth anyway, and they did it, and it was a great experience. So, so awesome. You can get more information from all those. You mentioned Heads Up, which is our film, headsupfilm.com, which is more information about breech babies. Now, where do we find you online? Um, on Instagram and Twitter, it's Jen, J-E-N underscore Lily, L-I-L-L-E-Y. And on Facebook, it's like backslash generally official yeah that's official mm-hmm. thanks a million for being here and thanks sharing for me. generously and openly about <laughs> your interesting life and you're going to come back hopefully twice once with your birth story and once so we can really get into foster care and adoption on a much deeper level yeah at home thanks for listening to our show if you have any questions or topic suggestions uh shoot us an email info at informedpregnancy.com <laughs>